Hello, people, and welcome to the grand stage of JK's and Friends Unscripted podcast, the podcast where the beginning is just a glimpse and the ending is a mystery unwritten. Here, we steer into the heart of discovery, navigating through a sea of insights, the thrill of surprises, and the authenticity of real-life sagas shared by our distinguished guests. Every episode is a voyage, and you're an essential part of this expedition. Our guest today is Keith Harvey, CEO of UGP Energy LTD and Inc., a cardiac arrest survivor from Glasgow, Scotland. Keith, good morning. Morning, JK. Nice to see you. You have better weather than I have. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, uh, I think. I think this is a. Uh... This is this is what I get every each time that I have a call with someone. They tell me exactly that. So I assume that it is very gray and raining in Europe at the moment. <laughs> you assume correctly, as always. As always. So um, I I'm very excited about this podcast, and I and I tell you why. I, I'm excited because I speak to a lot of people, as I told you the first time and then when I had this conversation the very first call that I had with you I was just blown away by the resilience and the innovation that you are mastering through your life I mean that is that is just crazy so you told me that you had multiple sudden cardiac arrest you told me that you run an, a, a, a smaller business in, in Scotland, if I get it right. Yep. Um, you're, you and your family to a really challenging time. So let's get started because I, you, that story that you have to say is just, my goodness, I can't wait for everyone to, to hear it. So I'm going to ask you this one question. Who is Keith Harvey? Who is Keith Harvey? Keith Harvey is a sun-loving, resilient, a driven, lucky to be here individual. Okay, that's that's deep. And if you could tell our listeners where you're from, uh what is your your job or your current occupation? How old are you? Yeah, so um, fifty three years old, married with two children, grown up children. Uh, my daughter's married uh, to her wife, and they have their two dogs. My son's at university, was in Miami on a soccer scholarship. Oh wow! I loved Miami. Soccer wasn't what you expected it to be, and after an attempted the uh, carjacking at Pistol Point, you decided enough was enough, and it was time to come home. I, I run a, a, a sudden cardiac arrest survivor, which not many people can say, which is exciting, scary, and, and has a lot of issues along with it. And I'm the current CEO of a renewable energy business, what based here in Scotland. It's at startup fundraising stage. But we've also got an entity formed in Pennsylvania, USA, where we have massive support at the highest levels of politics, right down to business level. Wow, that is uh, that is crazy. So, sorry, the most important the most important part I should say is uh, I'll be married twenty years come the fifteenth of July uh, next year, uh, and without my wife, I wouldn't be here to talk this, have this discussion with you. So yes, that, I that, remember. That, that, I remember that and I, I, I am going to touch on that and you make it very easy for me to ask you our, my second question. So during our first call, you told me that you are treating life like it's your last day and you make it count every single day. Now, because of the sudden, uh, you know, the cardiac arrest that you had uh, multiple times, how is that? How do you apply living, like running this business that is between two continents, family life, and living your life like it's your last day? Because, like, I think that everyone that wants to live his life like the next day, it means I'm going to live to the fullest. So, how do you do that? Try to. I certainly try to. 
and it's it's a recent a recent occurrence because the the cardiac arrest and all the issues that went with it that we discussed previously, the stress, anxiety, PTSD, a year under a psychologist, uh, that get to grips with a whole load of things, but tomorrow is not guaranteed to anyone. So when you get to tomorrow, you've got to make the most of it, and that's that's just. Uh, Sometimes it's easier to say than it is to do, because there's a lot goes on. But that is my ethos. If I wake up in the morning, I should be grateful to be there and and try and make the the best and do the best with what you what you've got. And the one the one thing that I've learned through I've been asked for a couple of interviews by leading doctors and and psychologists through some of my LinkedIn cardiac arrest awareness posts. And that one thing about near death experience and coming back is eventually eventually it gives you a real sense of purpose once you realize how lucky you are to be able to be here and do things it become fairly fairly focused and focused in the bigger picture not not the insular what's important to you personally directly but as dr celeste explained it as well it was you, it tends to be that the, the, these survivors have a, a real higher sense of a purpose and desire to achieve what they set out to achieve. So, whilst the cardiac arrest was a traumatic and uh, a horrific experience, this is maybe one of the positives. And I'm, I've always been a fairly positive person, JK, and try and take the positives out of every situation. And I think it's maybe taking took a couple of years to get past all the, the, the horrible part of this cardiac arrest survival. And that's one thing that I would say that's probably quite prevalent now. Yeah. Now you said you experience a, what, what do you call it? A near death experience. So now yeah. of course, I'm sure that, you know, we all want to know what is it like? Is it like, the tunnel view, or is it how, how what do you, what do you experience? Well, one thing is important to say is now I have no fear of dying. Dying's the easiest thing in the world to do. Wow. Dead easy. So I had just rewind a little bit. So in November 2020, I had really serious COVID and I was in and out of the hospital and I was extremely ill. And then on the 19th of of June 2021, I went one better. I was nearly dead when I was in the with the COVID. And then I get out of my bed at half past 11 in that, at night. Luckily, my wife followed me through to the ensuite because I, I just didn't feel right. And I opened my ensuite window and it was like someone pulled the plug in the computer and the screen just came in and in and in and pop, gone. And it, it was quite a surreal experience because apparently, on the outside to my wife and son, I was, I just collapsed. Eyes still wide open, staring at them, lovingly, I hope, but <laughs> not breathing, uh, no pulse, unresponsive. Uh, and they managed to drag me out from beside the, the, the WC and into the bedroom. And then when it came to, uh, uh, my wife, we've discovered, as I've explained to you, had a lucky recovery blow she was telling me not to die very kindly and she thumped me in the chest at the right pressure which brought it back I, and my opening words to her were what are you phone an ambulance for i'm fine I don't, I don't need an ambulance and we now know apparently i really needed an ambulance because i had to be defibbed again a couple of times in that on the way to hospital my goodness but in that period where where I was looking lovingly at her with my eyes open, non-responsive. I had, I had no pulse, no heartbeat, wasn't breathing. But from my perspective in there, I was in a, if you imagine being in a really dark room, and if you're in a place that you don't really know, you're aware that there's obstacles and there's entities and there's things in that place. That's what I had. That was my a, experience. Uh, there was noises and, and entities and obstacles and just there was things there uh, and then coming out the other side of it which thankfully i did 
it was it was the the old an analogy of the you see some light at the end of the tunnel, and I went from from the opposite end of when it first started where the the computer screen came in and and ended up with a tiny little dot and then my lights went out basically uh-huh. <laughs> to get out of the ways. There was something that a little pin speck, and eventually the that my vision filled out and I was lying in my bedroom floor. My goodness. Strange, strange experience. So that must have been... So you say dying is an easy thing to do, but now I'm projecting myself in this room. It must have been panic. Like you were out, obviously, but then your wife is now trying to save your life. Your son is witnessing the whole thing. And... Yeah. How how are they coping with this? Hey, they've they've coped pretty well, to be fair. Uh, th- there'll obviously be the scars there, and there's we couldn't watch television with a uh, defibrillation going off without everybody shuddering and they groan. But but yeah, they they've they've coped pretty well with the whole scenario. Wow! Uh, because I, I don't I don't imagine it was easy to live with for a while after it happened. So it's fair to say that your wife saved your life yeah. twice because she once she married you and the second time she literally saved the, your life. <laughs> Got it in one, sir. <laughs> Now it's you know it's it's leading to my next question because you know I you know that I've been a top tier executive, you know, and I stepped out my career just because work-life balance um, and also because I feel that my life is more important than, gen- than generating money for multinationals, right? Yep. And would you agree with me or give me your take on the important role that your family has versus your career. I'd like to hear it from you, especially when you were that close of checking out. Yeah. Uh, well, my situation is different to yours where you were financially uh, secure to, to retire. Uh, had it not been for the, 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 the way things went, COVID come along and, and the, the, the COVID that I suffered plus the COVID uh, world effect plus the cardiac arrest, I lost two businesses in my very kind Phoenix Life Life Assurance Company who I'd paid into for 20 odd years for critical illness cover. I found a way to wheedle out of paying out on my policy. So after the cardiac arrest, I spent a year and a half unable to earn, with no ability to earn, mm. I, I, and dwindled down what funds we had saved away because of late time of things. But anyway, Uh, that that's what it is but in terms of life work balance i think it's really important because the stress caused by work leads to heart issues leads to you not being here so i have spent as we spend as much time as we can in fact myself and my wife went out for lunch today just in the, at the drop of a hat let's go and spend time together so i think that side of things is important knowing when to switch off from work is definitely important, but for me, I don't see work as a chore. I, and and, and I, at the moment, I'm not earning any money, don't have any money, money is not my driver. But this business is an opportunity to be so much more, which will then give my wife and family financial security. But the, the money will come as it is on the back of it not being the focus of attention on it. Yes, I, I totally, I totally agree. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, and you know that as well. I've, I've created a, a, a company. Although I was, I was going into an investment project in myself, and then I just talking to people, I realized that a lot of people have been unable to save. Let's say, right? And I'm not saying because they didn't make enough money. It's just because. Society doesn't teach us to 
save for rainy days. You see? Yeah. Um, uh, so I've created this company called Full Circle where I give my friends and people that, and people who are interested in joining the possibility of creating that safety net, you know, so they invest and then I give them a return on investment. That return investment is back with my money. Now, uh, it's, it's so, it's so interesting that you say that because you say two very important things that resonates with me. And that was always my mentality. Money is not what defines you. Okay. Yeah. Your title is not what defines you. It's what you do with the both that is going to define you, right? So money is a tool. It's just a single tool. It's just a screwdriver for life, right? Or a Swiss knife, I'm going to call it. So if you have the Swiss knife, you can go through the jungle and come out pretty, um, pretty okay. <laughs> so yep. what I love what you said, you said, this is not what drives me. And, and obviously we know now why, but then you are saying, okay, I'm sick. I can pretty much get a heart attack any minute now because uh, I'm, I'm uh, I subscribe to, <laughs> to this, you know? But yes, I'm, I'm creating a new business cross-continent, okay? That is very, a, a very bold move. But how did you get the strength to do that? Because, again, you say, I'm not doing it for the money. So if you're not doing it for the money, what are you doing it for? Well, it's, quite, it's quite a long answer. Go ahead. The, the answer to that, and, uh, and it takes uh, over a period of 18 months. So from the cardiac arrest, I have I've, I now have a, a, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator in my chest. So the 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 consultant now I've got I've got two full chest plates, tattoos everywhere. But I'm still old school enough that if I was to wear a short sleeve shirt like you've got on, no one would know I have a tattoo. So personal and they all mean things to me. Uh, but on my left chest plate where they were putting this was a was a as a full on Buddha tattoo. And the, the big Chinese guy called Jackson was the assistant consultant. And Jackson came into the room while I was lying waiting to go and get the operation done. Uh, and Professor Gardner said to him, so there's a, there's a bit of fun along the way as well. Prof Gardner says to him, oh, Jackson, what are you doing in here today? And he said, oh, this young gentleman lying in the slab here has said, uh, we've gone really well during the last week. And he's offered to allow me to try my skills out and put one of these in. So, but he's nudging me at the side and he's saying, I'm only kidding, Keith. I'm only about a week away from becoming a full consultant. I've done a 30 or 40 of these things. So anyway, I said to him, right, okay, that's fine. I'll let Prof Gardner, I'll let Jackson do it. But you see this Buddha here? I'd better not wake up with his head over here and his body, his, his nose down here. It better all line up. So to cut a long story short, he, he did that and he lined it up and it took 20 minutes longer in the operation because he's done it perfect. You wouldn't even know that there was a thing in there. But the, it's a titanium box, three leads drilled through my collarbone, and the three leads are embedded in my heart. Wow. One, one sets my heart rate, one uh, sends a signal if it goes out of, it's out of sync and it's not right, and the third one uh, delivers a boom and uh, defibs me. So I'm basically unkillable, JK. The, uh, if I die now, sitting here talking to you, uh, there would be defibbed, and I'd probably back up speaking to you in five minutes. Oh, wow. Everything he gives.